Father, those words are beyond our imagination. You reign. We're here to worship. Father, we know that faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. So as we hear the Word of God today, touch us with the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. John chapter 9, if you have your Bible with you this morning, John chapter 9. We continue the journey in this period in between the resurrection and the ascension of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Next Sunday we celebrate and we teach on the ascension. Jesus said, it's good that I go, because if I go, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. Whoa, uh, that's, that's the real deal. That's what we're experiencing today. And then right after the ascension, we're going to get into uh, the inaugural service of the Holy Spirit called Pentecost. So today we're going to look at the healing ministry of Jesus. Uh, this guy named Jesus, the Jesus that we study, that rose from the dead, that conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave, walked on the earth for 40 days, presented himself to over 500 people. He's real. He's real. He's, he's Jesus. We have never found his bones and we're going to look at something kind of unique today. Reading in John chapter 9, verse number 1. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jewish tradition believed that if the parents sinned, it affected the children. Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And having said these things, he spit on the ground. He made mud with saliva. And then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Hallelujah. Now if that happened in Wapiton today, do you think the whole town would know about it by tonight? I think so. This morning I simply want to take the next few minutes to talk to you about three things. When you hear the voice of God and you experience a touch, when you hear the voice of Jesus and you experience a touch from Jesus, it automatically enlightens your spirit, spirit to respond to Jesus. Let me say that again. When you hear the voice of Jesus, when you feel the touch of Jesus, it's going to automatically cause you to respond to Jesus. That's what's going on in our text today. First off, we have two voices. We have a voice from the world, which is the enemy, and we have a voice from Jesus. <coughs> What happens to you when you hear the voice of Jesus? Do you respond to it? Something that is beyond my understanding in this text, but if you study the whole chapter, how it unfolds, you kind of get it. This man that they walked by that was blind never says a word until later after he's given his sight back. So here's the picture. Jesus' disciples walking along, man's blind sitting over there, and they just stop. And they start to talk about him. They didn't ask him if they could talk about him. They didn't invite him into the conversation or anything. They just start talking about him. The disciples say, hey, look, the man's blind. Who sinned, his parents or him? And he's sitting there listening to that. Think of that. Have you ever talked about somebody that wasn't there? Don't have to say amen to that one. <laughs> Have you ever talked about someone who was there, but you acted as if they were not there? I see this happen a lot with dementia people. It just makes my skin crawl. Because you'll have family members talking about the person who is sitting right there as if they're not there. That's what's going on here. So I want to talk to you this morning about this period between they talked about him, where he was healed, and where Jesus encounters him later on in the day. This period called limbo. I think a lot of us live in limbo, land of limbo. 
You know what limbo is? Limbo is that little song where we dance underneath the stick. I'm not going to do it. No. You know what I mean. Initially, that song was written by a lady, I'm pretty sure her name was Julia Howard, in a little island in the Southern Caribbean called Trinidad. And she wrote this little jingle to model, get this, what it means to go from death to life. The limbo started out with the stick on the ground. And you can't get under it. And as you raised it up little by little, they would scoot under the stick. And as they continued to raise the stick, you could crawl under. Pretty soon you could walk under it to model death to life. That's what she wanted to, to model. Guess who got a hold of it? Hollyweird. And Hollyweird took it and said, no, 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 that doesn't make any sense. We got to go from life to death. Literally. So Hollywood took it and started the stick here. Who was it? Chuck Berry? One of them guys. And you keep working it down to death. We don't live in the land of the living and we're going to the land of dying. We live in the land of dying going to the land of the living. That's what she wanted to model. I'm worried that we got a group of people that, here, that are maybe sitting here that are maybe listening that live in the land of limbo. And you're going to understand what I'm talking about here. Because the disciples are all concerned about this guy and why he can't see. Voice of the world. Do you operate in the voice of the world or the voice of Jesus? If you're operating in the voice of the world, you're always concerned about what's the problem. You're always trying to figure it out. I mean, think about it. Isn't that what we do? Come upon a, come upon a car accident and people are bleeding and hanging in their seatbelts and should I call the police? No, we're, we're always worried about the problem. That's the physical nature of the human condition. Who sinned, Jesus? It's just like us. How did he end up like this? So what we do is we try to place the blame on somebody else. And when we live in the voice of the world, we, we lack vision. What couldn't he do? See. We lack vision. We want to blame somebody else for my problem. And as long as I can blame somebody else for my problem, it's not my problem, and now that person has to fix me. Did you catch that? Because as long as it's not about me, I don't have to deal with it. But if it's about you, now you deal with it. You broke me. You hurt me. 45 years old, still blaming mom and dad for something that happened to them when they were eight. Blaming somebody else. That's literally what the disciples are here talking about. And the guy was not deaf. He was just blind. He heard the whole conversation. So when we blame somebody else, and you're blaming the other person, the other person that you're talking about, you put them into a crisis. Right? Because now they're hearing what you're saying about them, and now they're in a crisis. Whoa, 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 that ain't true. So now they're starting to receive what you say and you want them to suffer because you're blaming someone else. It's nothing like being the victim of someone else's rage. You ever experience that? That's what we do when we put the blame on somebody else. Who sinned? Jesus, this guy ain't right. You ever been to a Christmas celebration, Thanksgiving, what, whatever it is, Resurrection Sunday, and the whole family's there. You're all sitting in the living room. Oh, but boy, you better not say this one thing because it's going to set him off. <laughs> We've been there. And you know what? I, I came up with It's like strychnine. You can't taste the venom, but there's going to be after effects. Blaming other people. So we don't really say what we want to say, so we just kind of... Have dinner and leave well enough alone. Blaming other people. Relationships gone bad when we blame. What do we lose? We lose connectivity. We lose love. We lose intimacy. We lose all the things that God wants us to have when we do that. There's something attached to this, and it's called the spirit of accusation. The spirit of accusation is rampant today. I'm going to accuse you of what's wrong with me so I don't have to deal with me. I want to be a woman. And don't you dare tell me I can't be. 
And if you do, I'm going to get mad. Spirit of accusation. Spirit of self-righteousness. That's intense. And I love how this thing unfolds because that's the voice of the world. And then all of a sudden, we don't get the whole conversation, but all of a sudden, Jesus comes on the scene and we have the voice of what? We have the voice of Jesus. And Jesus confronts the spirit of accusation. He says, guys, listen, don't accuse the parents of what's wrong with this guy. Because that ain't the case. The voice of Jesus says it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So, let's go back to the Garden of Eden. What happened? Adam and Eve are in a relationship with Jesus. They willingly gave it up and became sinful condition because they became one with the enemy. And now the enemy is saying to God, Look what I did. I got your children to fall. They're going to have pain. They're going to be born blind. They're going to suffer from heartaches, broken hearts. And look at me. That's what the devil did to God. See what Jesus is doing to the devil? Not only did he rebuke the disciples, but he confronted the enemy. And he says, listen, enemy, you think you're causing my children to suffer, but when my children turn to me and let me healed them, I can take what you thought was bad and I can make it for good. That's what he did. No more self-righteousness, no more spirit of accusation. Jesus says, I'm going to make good out of this. I'm going to make this thing so he can see. Jesus came to do the will of God and he'll make it right every time. He never misses. So when you're going through life and you hit that pain and you hit that, and maybe you're living in that land of limbo and you don't know what to do with it, what do you do? You turn to Jesus. And Jesus was 100%, heals it every time. You ended up where you're at because of someone else's blame? Don't go back to them. Turn to Jesus. He'll take care of the whole situation. He's got your back. Not only did he address the spirit of accusation, he rebuked the, the disciples. He covered the whole thing in one little sentence. This is what he says. It was not that the man sinned. Disciples, listen up. It wasn't that he sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed. Jesus goes from Genesis to himself in a matter of 15 words. I love studying Jesus. I mean, he's the master in language. He's the master in communicating what he wants to communicate. And I think the disciples were just sat down right there and said, whoa. This guy knows what he's talking about. I have an attorney that'll plead my case. Anytime you get in a position where you're in a bind, I have an attorney that'll cover my back. He goes to bat for me. He covers it all. He'll rebuke who needs to be rebuked. He heals me in the meantime, and God gets the glory. God makes sense. He's going to make strength out of my weakness. And as long as I'm thinking I'm really somebody, oh, I'm going to blame everybody else, he can't work. But when you back out of that and stop letting the spirit of accusation work in you and say, I need you, Jesus, now he can work. And he'll be strong in your weakness. The only reason we have a need to blame anybody in the first place is because we're disappointed with ourselves. Jesus will take care of it. So many times you cope, I cope, we cope with the disappointment by making someone else suffer. And that's what they're saying here. Jesus says, no, guys, listen, don't blame the father or the mother. Sin came into the world. I'll make it right. Give God the glory. So in other words, he got what back? Vision. I'm talking about the land of limbo today. Have you ever been confronted with the voice of God and experienced a touch of God and you backed off? Listen, this God thing's kind of weird. I don't know if I want to listen, and I don't know if he wants to touch me. It's up to you. It's your choice. Remember, the guy sitting there hadn't said a word yet. Not a word. I mean, this guy could have any time said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, guys. I'm right here. I'm blind, not because of mom and dad. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't interject nothing into this conversation. And then he listens to the voice of God. And Jesus says, we've got to work while it's daylight. I'm the light of the world. Don't back off of this thing because there's going to come a time when it's dark. Verse number six, having said these things, he spit on the ground 
made mud with saliva. There's a cool mixture. Partially true because the Jewish tradition believed that the male saliva had healing, <laughs> healing powers. Many times the male in Jewish tradition would spit and put it on a wound because they believed that the saliva, and saliva does have healing powers. But Jesus mixed it with dirt. Why? To signify that we were created from dust. Sin came in, broke us. We can't see. It's a picture of the fallen world. And then he anoints the man's eyes with the mud, and he says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Anoint means, when you get anointed with oil, means to smear it in. He didn't tell him to close your eyes, dude. I'm going to smear some mud in your eyes right now. No, you know what he did? He walked up to the guy. If he had glasses, he took his glasses off. And he went like this. And he smeared the mud on his eyeball. That's what it means to anoint. And the guy still has said nothing. The kids in class this morning said, Ouch! We don't get ouch. He anointed the man's eyes with mud, and he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. When you hear the voice of God and you experience the touch of God, do you go and do what God says? There's your land of limbo. I struggled with this for 25 years. Clearly hearing the voice of God, clearly experiencing the touch of God, and clearly saying, no. That causes limbo. And the Catholic tradition believes that limbo is a place that you go when you didn't get baptized or to know for sure what happened to you. Limbo. You in that land today? You know what limbo causes you to have? Anger, frustration, resentment, spirit of accusation. Well, it's because that guy wants me to stay on his farm. It's because they want me to farm their land. Whatever the accusation is, you put yourself into the situation. If you're living in the land of limbo, you can slip under the spirit of accusation really pretty fast. Because it's everybody else's fault why I'm here. This text doesn't say that. This guy heard the voice of God, experienced the touch of God, which probably wasn't very pleasant, and then he went. It's all we have. I'm going to go, because that's what he told me to do. When's the last time God told you to do something, and you went? Big amen on that one? We don't. We get scared. God says, ooh, does God really know what he's talking about? I think God's a little bipolar today. Do you? Listen, touch, go. Simple as that. And the man went. Now, we know that the pool of Siloam was probably at least two to three blocks away from where he was. This guy has never seen the face of Jesus. He only knows his voice. He finds his way to, pool, to the pool. You read the rest of the text. It's on the Sabbath. He comes back seeing, and everybody in town's excited. When you start right after verse number 8 here and get into verse number 9 and 10, look at 10. So they said to him, then how were your eyes open? Isn't this just like people to blame somebody else? Who did this to you? This is the first time the guy was ever able to see trees. A blue sky. Somebody's hair. I mean, can you imagine the excitement inside of him? And all they're worried about is, who did it to you? They just grill this poor guy for the next 30 verses. How were your eyes opened? This is what he says. Man called Jesus, made mud, anointed my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I what? I went. What did he function out of? Faith. He functioned out of faith that this guy was real because he opened my eyes and he was obedient to hearing the word of God. Obedience. I went, I washed, I received my sight. Where is he? I don't know. And you go a little further in the text, verse number 25. Now the Pharisees, the people of the church, found out and they want to know just remember now, this is all in the period of one afternoon. 
Verse number 25, they're interrogating him. They asked his parents. The parent says, he's old enough to know. Now they answer, he, they say, whether he is a sinner, he says, whether he is a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. You know, just, just put this into the, into the context. He's standing in front of a whole bunch of pastors, the priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who did this to you? This was a sinner. They're trying to put the blame on somebody else. Listen, guys, I don't know, but I was blind, and now I see. What don't you get? That's how I read the text. Then they said to him, where did, what did he do to you? I mean, this just gets worse. What did he do to you? I just told you three times. How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have already told you, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become one of his disciples? Now he's starting to get a little sarcastic with them. You can just feel the tension there. So if you're in the land of limbo, and God has given you sight, and you've heard the voice of God, and he's told you what to do, how come you haven't done it? Why do you stop? Why do you take one step and... Go back. It's just strictly a story of obedience. But remember the spirit, the spirit of accusation. Who healed you? We want to blame that guy who touched you. We want to blame him. We want to get him in here. It's all the spirit of accusation. We've got to be very careful with the spirit of accusation. The spirit of accusation splits churches, splits marriages, causes children to go against parents, parents to go against children. Children to go against children. You ever see two kids? He did it. He did it. She did it. Mom comes in and says, who did it? I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's what this text is. Going back and forth. Nobody wants, everybody wants to accuse the spirit of accusation stops ministry. If you go back to verse number four, we must work the works of him who sent me while it's still day. Night's coming. No one can work. Jesus says, I'm here. I'm the light of the world. We got work to do. We got work to do. This is the real deal. And you guys are worried about who sinned? See how easy it is to get caught up in that? And what find, I find really interesting is the man who was the furthest away from Jesus, born blind, Never knew Jesus. And the people who should have been the closest to Jesus, the Pharisees, end up the furthest away from Jesus, and the man born blind ended up the closest to Jesus. The spirit of accusation is intense. Maybe it's time we quit calling the police and start calling the ambulance. Maybe it's time to just simply admit, I can't figure this out. I'm, I'm not going to blame, I'm not going to accuse, I just can't figure it out. I have to accept the fact that some things about God are mystery. It, it's almost an arrogant thing for the infinite mind to think we can figure out, I turn that around, the finite mind can actually figure out what the infinite mind of God can do. Call the ambulance. In other words, call on Jesus, the one who can do the work. Verse 35, Jesus heard about this poor guy in this afternoon and how it all unfolded and that they cast him out of the synagogue, temple, and he found him. This man has heard the voice of Jesus. He's been touched by Jesus. And this is what he says. Do you believe in the Son of Man? I love this next verse. This guy has been given sight. He's been run through the ringer all afternoon in front of the Pharisees. He's been to the church. He's ready to go home and say, I can see. And he still doesn't know who Jesus is. And he answered, and who is he? he all that happened. And he stood up for him. He called him Jesus. He called him a prophet. And he says, who is he? that I may believe in him. Guess what? There's my preposition. In, in Greek, is in, but ace 
In Greek is into. He's sitting at the feet of Jesus and he says, Who is he, sir, that I may believe into him? That I may trust him. He touched me today. He opened my eyes. I got to see. I want to believe into him. Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And what do you do after you believe? You worship. There's something else so powerful in John chapter 9. Eight times the verb comes up, see. Seven times it's blepo, which is a verb I haven't taught you, but it's still the word see. But it's to see in the physical. I can see you physically. But here's my favorite verb. He says, you have seen him. Your spiritual eyes have been opened. Your, your mind's eye could see Jesus. <laughs> Didn't happen by accident. We read that in English. All we see is see. See what I'm saying? I thought that was good. <laughs> but to get it, to, to, you have seen him. You got it. You got it. You know who I am. You heard the voice, you experienced the touch, and his spirit responded. It demands a response, and he says, I believe. I really firmly believe, after being in the ministry for 15 years, we have people who have heard, we have people who have been touched, and never believe. They go to church. They carry Bibles around. They go to Bible studies. They listen to Christian radio. They listen to Christian music. And when you sit beside their bed when they're sick and the possibility of dying, and you ask them one simple question, if you close your eyes today and they don't open, do you know what's going to happen to you? I don't know. It breaks my heart. How can you live your whole life saying that you believe in Jesus and you're going to come to the end of your life and then you say, I don't know. It doesn't add up to me. And I really think it's because they've never been asked, do you believe? Jesus just simply asked him. Hearing the voice of God, experiencing the touch of God demands a response to him. Do you believe him? I mean, we're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're in this period before he ascends. Do you believe that he's the real deal? Can he heal you of cancer? Yes. Is he alive? Yes. He ascended into heaven, but then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, when you confess to believe he's in you, whole and complete. We learned that last week. And, and you want to say, I don't know. How can that happen? So I stand before you today, and anybody listening to this, if you've ever been in a situation where you've totally pushed him away and said, I don't want to hear from you, Jesus. I've had enough of you, Jesus stuff. I don't want you to touch me either. But if you have, maybe today's the day to say, I believe into Jesus the Christ. Whole, sold out, complete. Maybe you need a second touch. There's a whole nother sermon. But I'm just going to touch on it. Yeah, I'm going to roll with them today. He touched him. He stood his ground. But then Jesus asked him. Maybe you need a second touch. It's biblical. It happens more than once. When you get a second touch, go to Colossians 2.15. Here's what happens. When you confess to believe, when you hear the voice of Jesus, Jesus disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. When you confess to believe, this word disarmed is apec duomai. I don't expect any of you to remember that, but I just love telling you those words. Apec duomai simply means that the power and the authority of Jesus. He says, if you're going to believe into me, this is what I'm going to do for you. I stood before the devil and I stripped him of all of his power. He said, you thought you were going to cause my children to be born blind. I pulled that off of you. 
I'll give sight back to my kids. You thought, devil, that my kids were going to be deaf. I took that away from you too. I took it all away from you, devil, and ultimately you thought you were going to cause death. I took that away from you too. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and he put them to open shame. So when you confess to believe into Jesus the Christ, you receive a God who is your attorney, who goes to bat for you, who takes care of the enemy, who fights the battles for you, and you get to sit there and say, thank you, Jesus. You did it for me. Hallelujah. Get out of the land of limbo. You've been brought from death to life, not from life to death. And if you're in limbo today, we're praying for you. We're praying for you. Because this is real. Real people getting sight back, getting vision back. I want to bring one more thing to your attention as we bring this to a close. Look at our purpose statement. We're talking about moving. We're talking about people being healed. What we do at RLL. It's on the inside of your bulletin, too. The inside of your bulletin says purpose, what we do. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit to reach others for Christ. What did Jesus tell the disciples? We got to work while the sun shines. We got to do this thing while the sun shines. Our whole purpose, the reason we exist, empowered by the Holy Spirit to reach others for Jesus. If you're not sold out for Jesus and if you don't understand this purpose statement, you're missing the fact that it's still time. I mean, do you understand what Jesus says in verse number four? You got people who don't know me and I'm going to run out of time because I'm coming back. And we sit here Sunday after Sunday just kind of coming together in a huddle. He says, no, we, we are going to work. We're going to take the message out there, powered by the Holy Spirit to reach others for Christ. That's verse number four. That's what we do, but why do we do it? Why do we do what we do? To make committed followers, to make committed followers of Christ who lovingly reach into the community to Jesus. What'd he tell the guy when he got healed? Go. Have you heard the voice of God? Have you experienced the touch of God and you responded to God and you said yes to Jesus? He says go. Go. We can't sit here and just hold this message for our own. He's called us to go. It's an emph empathetic go. That you continually go. You didn't go this morning or this afternoon. You continually go for the rest of your life. And you know what you get to say? Jesus touched me. I once was dead and now I'm alive. I have sight and I get to see. It's all about the vision. Everything we do is centered on reaching people for Christ. Both our purpose, what we do, and our mission, why we do it. He came with a vision of new humanity his mission would create. He modeled the kind of life we all need to live in order to catch the world's attention. Are we catching the world's attention? We wrote this five years ago when the church came together. Do you think the blind man who was given his sight caught the town's attention? According to the text he did, he had all the priests and the Pharisees all wound up all afternoon. He modeled the kind of life we all need to live in order to catch the world's attention and bring people into a relationship with him. 